Cool. So there's some questions in the chat. Do add more uh, in the Q and A. Do add more. Um, so I'm going to start with a couple on well, a couple on kind of uh, regulations and water quality. So are there any regulations about water quality and covered cropping? So as far as I know, there are not there, there aren't strict regulations that are being enforced. It depends on your local either environmental health. If you're packing stuff, they might want to have a look or the water company might be interested. Water companies normally more interested in what happens in terms of backflow from your system into the main. So if you're using mains water, they're not going to want that to be coming in contact with uh, either the soil or any other water that you've collected. If there's any chance that in an outage, i.e. when mains water isn't working, it's possible there's a reverse of flow. So it starts to suck it back. And if you've got your garden hose topping up a pond and then the pressure goes negative, essentially, rather than pushing water out, starting to suck it back, that water goes straight into your mains system that's supplying your kitchen tap. And if you imagine that on a large scale with like dairy farms and uh, town water supplies, you can imagine why they're a little bit cautious about people not having backflow prevention. Um, in terms of uh, your own crops, um, I think it's at the moment just a matter of being really sensible because um, there are situations where there have been problems. Obviously, there was the kind of Spanish cucumber incident that turned out to be um, mung beans or something, E. coli. I think really those sort of problems are usually associated with livestock runoff, uh, animal manures, and possibly human pathogens getting into the water. If you're using rainwater, that's not going to be too much of an issue. If you're using your own reservoir, um, again, it's probably not an issue. If you can filter, you know, it's really important to filter your water because it bungs up all your sprinklers and all your drippers if you don't. If you can get some form of quite fine mesh filter in, sand filtration is really good. Um, if you are growing a lot of leafy salad crops that you're overheading, it's better to have mains as a backup for that. Um, so you have like a parallel main system that can run into your your irrigation system. Um, and then you've got uh, you know UV and other reverse osmosis systems that can be used to get the water really clean. Um, <clears throat> But I think it's one of those things where for as long as there's not a problem, people are at the moment not running around policing it. Um, and if you get somebody who's very uh, vigilant, they might bring up an issue if, you, if they're worried about the water you're using. Um, but that's very much dependent on the individuals that come around and look. OK, thanks. And then another one on, well, another couple of people have asked about Legionnaire's disease. Yeah, Legionnaires is an interesting one because, OK, there's, there's two things that Legionnaires disease needs. It needs to be a certain temperature and it needs to be in mist form and you need to breathe it in. And that's why it's usually an issue in like air conditioning systems and possibly even like shower systems that haven't been kept hot. So um, if you've got water that's lukewarm sitting in pipes and then you create a fine spray and then you breathe in that fine spray, you are at risk of legionnaires. Now that means that uh, growers, particularly in glass houses, and you know, I've, I've looked into this quite a lot at, at Hankham, um, that potentially if your water is sitting in those pipes and then you overhead and you breathe in some of that mist, you are at risk. Interestingly, though, the cases of legionnaires disease in horticulture have uh, the only cases that I've heard of have been associated with compost, where people have been doing potting up and breathed in compost fumes or steam or whatever. Um, no, as far as I know, there have been no reported cases of Legionnaire's disease from people breathing in mist spray from sprinklers. However, it is something to be really aware of. And the best thing you can do is um, flush out stale water from your system. And if you have a, uh, a drain valve at the end of your overhead system, um, you can just 
flush out the the the, the warm water and then the um the next lot of water coming through is going to be fresh and you can also clean out your pipes we did it a few times when you get the biofilm build, build up in the pipes this is where the bacteria can be a problem and one way of doing it is to put a hoover at one end of the pipe you open it up um suck a string through and then tie a rag to the end of the rope draw it through obviously you've got to kind of get the sizes correct and make sure there's nothing in the way that's going to block it but you can draw that through and clean out the biofilm um it's not going to be so easy for underground pipes but they don't seem to have such a problem anyway it's more the things that get warm that are in the sunlight and um then once you've done that you can always flush your pipes through with something like um uh what's the stuff hyperox hyperoxy acetic acid um obviously being really careful that none of that ends up on the crop but it's just a matter of that's just one way you can clean pipes um <clears throat> so yeah you've got options for cleaning um but my main re recommendation to avoid legionnaires is don't go and if you want to miss down your tomatoes or whatever in the middle of the day you want to keep the humidity up You've got warm water in those pipes. If if no fresh water has been in those pipes for two or three days, don't whack it on and then start walking around in all the mist going, oh, this is nice and cool. That's probably uh, uh, that's probably a high-risk environment for Legionnaires. Um, but interestingly, it hasn't really been an issue. It hasn't been flagged up as, as an issue. It's usually water domestic water systems in hotels. And uh, it's all about the temperature. So again, in the winter, probably tail end of autumn spring it's not going to be an issue it's really a summer warm pipe issue okay thanks for that um a couple of questions was there's three questions um sort of the simplest version is drip irrigation versus sprinklers then we've got preference so stop me if i'm asking you too much at once second question is there a preference between drip standing sprinklers traveling sprinklers in terms of water use efficiency so that's uh, sam who's on mains on a small scale trying to weigh out the pros and cons can you cope mm -hmm. with one more or do you want to answer those two first? so the first one was uh, drip versus sprinkler yeah um i think uh they're, they're they're kind of used for two different things and i would use both uh certainly in protected cropping dripping drippers are great because you don't always want the humidity uh in the system but you do want the option of increasing the humidity um you don't want to be wasting water so in a warm uh polytunnel or glass house just feeding straight to the roots with drippers is is uh really is the way you need to go but you need that option of getting everything wet there's reasons for soil health you know i think that drippers are great but they leave, they, they kind of are just concentrating on the roots and they're not looking at the overall health of this, the wider soil, um, which you know is a similar situation to using you know, fertilizers that, that are just targeted at plants rather than um, things that are, are there to improve the overall health of your soil. And when you're planting young plants, drippers are pretty limited in, in getting those established. So you want sprinklers especially if you've got quite close spacing you want sprinklers or direct sown crops you really want sprinklers to get a nice even um, watering to to the bed and then the drippers come into their own once you've got a mature crop with a good root system that can find the water it needs as well as the nutrients it needs so i would um i would say like here's an example you plant a load of uh, pak choy out say and then you use sprinklers to get them established and then if they're on a bed system probably drippers are unnecessary particularly if they're outside but if you're growing things in rows then maybe you can get a bit of drip tape or drip line down the row and that's going to save water and drippers really come into their own when you're growing through ground cover so having sets of drippers underneath the ground cover works really well because um the, they often it often holds the moisture in the the ground cover holds the moisture in the ground that's coming out the drippers and also um weeding crops with drip irrigation is a real pain in the ass and so if you're growing through ground cover um you're not having to weed it certainly you're not hoeing it or um steerage hoeing it or whatever mechanical device you might be using so then the, the drippers are, are a good thing to use there um 
looking what was the next question was about um different types of sprinklers yeah preference between drip standing sprinklers traveling sprinklers in terms of water use efficiency for somebody that's on mains on a small scale yeah so drippers are, are more efficient for sure but they're not they they shouldn't be the only tool in the toolbox because you need to get uh that like i said a moment ago you need to get that even coverage for getting things established the difference between sort of rolling sprinklers, boom sprinklers, or uh, stake sprinklers um, isn't. It's not a great. There's not a great deal in it, to be honest. It depends on the system that you um, you decide to go for. Really, if you're talking about efficiency, when you get to sprinklers, you want to be putting a certain amount of water on, depending on how dry the soil is. Um, and that amount of water is going to be roughly the same, whichever type of sprinkler you use. So it's more about doing the calculations correctly so that you know that if you set up your reel and boom system, that it's pulling it across the soil at the right speed for the amount of water you want to be getting on there. Um, and the same with the sprinklers, you're running them knowing what their application rate is. You're, you're running them for the right amount of time to get the right amount of water on um and that you're doing it the right time of day on the cover picture that we've got here of uh of tolly's uh boom coming across that i think there's squash you can see that the, the that you can see it's obviously in the summer you know the squash are getting established it's probably you know early july or time or so if you look at the hills at the back they're, they're dry you know the, the grass on those fields is is brown so obviously things need watering and the shadows are quite long, and I know from having been there that that's the sun's in the in the east, so that's being watered early in the morning. Uh, so that you know everything about that picture says to me this guy really knows what he's doing, which <laughs> doesn't need reiterating. But um, uh, that's like timing when you do it is more going to make efficient use of your water than a lot of other things. Like if you water early in the morning. Um, you're going to be watering onto cool soil that will absorb the water. And then as the as the day progresses, that water gets a chance to sink down through the soil before it starts to warm up and evaporate off the surface. So, yeah, in terms of efficiency, drippers are more efficient, but they can be a pain in the ass. Um, and it doesn't matter what type of sprinkler you use, you're going to be wanting to put on the same amount of water because it's about what your crop needs more than anything else and the timing when you do it okay thanks pete and then another one we've got two more ones really specific this is the quite specific well <laughs> there's moving on a bit with louise who's really intrigued by pulse watering she says watering with drip line for about um, about a minute around eight times a day it makes water yeah. go laterally as well as straight down so it increases area that has access to water from the drip lines yeah. could i use this in my fields we're small or is it just too expensive to get drip lines across the whole field instead of sprinklers um so if you if you use drip tape it's not very expensive it doesn't last as long as drip line which is quite expensive um i'd say probably if you want to set up if, if you're no dig that may be an option because if you're uh and you're pretty weed free um if you're trying to hoe your crops around loads of drip line that could become an issue some people recommend burying drip line um to get it out of the way like there are whole systems around doing this um that's that's fine if you're off grid but if you're running off mains that puts you at a real high risk as far as the water companies are concerned that puts you at a real high risk category um so if you're running off mains burying drip drip pipe is like one step worse than putting it on the surface which is worse than sprinklers, which is, <laughs> you know, like they have these, and, and there's a link at the back of, about, about that. Uh, they have categories of risk. And so making sure you've covered all the, the um, use of mains water regulations and the backflow and everything becomes really important because somebody could actually pull the plug on your operation if they came around and saw you buried drip tape and it was running straight off the mains. Um, I would say that cost it out in terms of you know using the materials and then think about how much work it's going to be but um i completely get what you're saying about pulse stripping um i used to do uh most of the summer crops at hankham i'd do i'd give them like five to ten minutes every day regular and then little top-ups so sometimes it would be more if it'd been been hot 
Um, but I think doing a, a regular, I, I don't know whether like every hour is necessary because um, actually you want your plants to go looking for water. If they're going to be drought resistant, if you want to be efficient, you can actually, there's loads of things you can do to reduce water use. Um, the way you the way you cultivate soil, you can create dust mulches, or you can create if you're no dig, you can create like heavy um, straw mulches or or um, you know, other ground covers. You can uh, try and get your plants to really look for water. And there's some people out there who just don't use irrigation. And um, something about the health of their soil, the type of soil, the way they establish their crops, the timing of their planting. Um, if you grow things direct, a lot of direct sown crops, they often don't need a lot of water beyond getting those seeds germinating um, because they put down a deep tap root. Um, they form mycorrhizal fungi relations. The, the soil itself uh, may have more or less organic matter, which holds onto soil, holds onto water. Um, there's something that I don't mention in the guide, but um, there's like the the soil matrix potential is kind of like this, like if the, the water in your soil will have a kind of desire to either move one way or the other. If you were to say, put a balloon in your soil and inflate it, is the soil going to, is the water going to be like pushing against the balloon or is it going to be pulling away from the balloon? And they have a tensiometer, which kind of measures in that kind of style. And what that is, is really looking at what the plant roots are experiencing. Are they experiencing uh, a negative pressure in the soil that's drawing the water out of them? Or are they ex experience a positive pressure that's pushing water into them? Um, you know, plants have various ways of regulating that themselves. But um, that can give you a hint of what the... Um, what the, the experience of the plant, if it's if the experience of the plant is that it's starting to become a little bit water stressed, it will go looking for more water and put down deeper roots. And then it will be less water stressed because it's found the water. And so if you can somehow do this kind of letting it dry out, getting it wet, let it dry out, get it wet, and just keeping within this boundary of keeping the plant healthy, giving it a reason to go looking for soil. So I could think I think that well, the one reason that you might not want to do sort of continuous pulse watering may be that sometimes it's good to actually let, particularly in the early stages. So if you're growing tomatoes, it's often recommended you get them planted, you give them one good water, and then you leave them. You walk away, and sometimes they can look like they're really struggling. But then they perk up, and what's happened is that they've put their roots out and they've gone looking for water. They've found the water they need, and that's that's basically establishing a really strong rooting plant. And if you just keep watering it and give it everything it needs, it's got no reason to go looking for water. So um, yeah, I think that there's information out there that you can find, and um, people that know a lot more about that than I do. But uh, it's worth looking at various options but um one of the things that, another thing i used to do is water the courgettes in the evening because they prefer to have the counterintuitively they prefer to have wet roots in the at night and then dry roots during the day because there's something about the sort of osmotic potential across the leaf surface that you can really avoid um really avoid powdery mildew by using this technique of if it's really hot and dry that you don't wet the roots too much and if it's damp and cool then you make sure the roots aren't dry and for some reason that really helps courgettes fight off powdery mildew and that's from years and years of growing courgettes in a glass house and growing squash outside that i would um really try not to water them in a hot summer if possible and last summer i didn't water our outdoor squash at all they were growing through ground cover uh, which helped but they didn't have any powdery mildew all the way up to the end of the autumn. So, um, yeah, maybe, maybe luck. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but there's <laughs> loads of details about all this stuff that, um, yeah, if you go looking for it, if you're interested in a specific crop or, or you have a specific soil type, um, yeah, there's there's information out there. You know, we're really lucky with the internet. And um, once you've sorted through all the rubbish, there are some gems to be found. Thanks, Pete. 
That was amazing. Um, right, a very specific question, which probably isn't relevant for a lot of people, but I find it funny, so I'm going to ask it from Antonia in Scotland. <laughs> Um, I have overheard sprinklers from LBS and every year they're blocked by a particular spider which sets oh, them yes. by the winter. Every year I have to evict them in the spring. Is there any way of putting them off? Also, the sprinklers drop out in the frost every year. I did wonder about gluing them in, but then I can't evict the spiders. Oh, <laughs> yeah, insects are an issue. Actually, if you look now, a lot of the irrigation companies are selling their sprinklers as uh, insect proof. Uh, so that just goes to show that it is it's a real issue you know it's not just you um oh, I had the same problem there's there's a spider that likes to get in little holes and for some reason they love sprinkler heads you get in the nozzle and then you turn it on and you have to dismantle it and poke it all out and yeah um you can buy the insect proof sprinkler heads see if they work um I actually used to bring most of the field irrigate well all of the field irrigation in over the over the winter if you've got somewhere to store it you can actually you know dismantle the the sprinkler head and put it in a box somewhere you're much less likely to have a problem but you know what's more work for you taking them all apart or having to go around and uh, evict the spiders in the spring <laughs> yeah but it's a good point i mean that yeah that i've had that experience myself spring after spring um and what was the other point there the uh, freeze yeah it's like where water gathers, there'll be problems if it freezes. So just making sure everything's drained down, um, you should avoid that. If there's no water in it, it won't pop apart. Um, but maybe there's a little place in there that the water's just sitting, even if you drain down the system. So without, you know, like you, you'll just have to have a good look at your sprinklers and see where that where the water's sitting in there. Um, I've had like uh, compression fitting taps where. I've drained everything down and thought, yeah, that's great. And then you come back after a freeze and the metal's broken. And you're like, how did the water step? Like, where did that come from? It's obviously just like pockets of water that that sit. Um, and so, yeah, drainage. I, I mentioned that quite a lot in the guide, like freeze protection and, and having good drainage for anything that's above ground is really important. Thanks. OK, a couple of questions on, well, on water down things. So Joe's asking, where can I get well water tested if that's what I should be doing? And Nick is asking, do you have any experience with dowsing and using ley lines to find where to establish a borehole? Uh, yeah, so first question, you can send water off to, uh, there are independent labs, um, but you can send it off to, um, I think it's the Environment Agency or the Water Company. I haven't, I haven't heard about anyone doing it for a while. I'm not quite sure exactly where you send it. I do remember a story um, <laughs> where I was quite young. It was a mate of mine I had as a teenager, and they had a well in their property in Devon, and they kept sending off samples to um, this sort of uh, water company recommended laboratory. And kept coming back saying, no, 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 it's no good, it's no good. And so they bottled up some tap water straight out the, the faucet, sent it off, and they got the same, line, no, no, you can't drink this. <laughs> so then they uh, they um, sent them the, a letter back telling them what they'd done. And they were like, oh, uh, send us another sample. We'll have a better look. And then they got a letter saying, yeah, yeah, your well water's fine. You can drink it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I don't know who the best people are, but whoever they were, I'll, I'll um, avoid them like the plague. <laughs> <clears throat> um no I, but yeah i don't i don't know uh i can't give you an address to send it to um you probably have to just do some more research um and then <clears throat> uh the other question was ley lines, uh, ley lines and dowsing so um my my mum actually got into dowsing for a bit and she found various water courses around their property they had a um a guy come and show them how to do it I'm pretty convinced that uh, if I'm pretty convinced that it can work. Um, I think the question is whether the person you get in really knows what they're doing. Um, and yeah, like these these people have been used by some pretty um, well regarded um, companies and have had a, have a track record of success. So. Uh, I'm not so sure about ley lines. Um, I suppose that's just like dowsing for water. Um, things we're talking about irrigation, I think, could could be really relevant. And if you can 
find somebody who has testimonials to their work that you can you can verify then great um uh ley lines um probably the same thing but um i'm not sure how that's going to affect your irrigation system but uh yeah it's a fascinating area of uh, of interest okay and then a couple more um louise is asking is it a good idea so on slightly different subjects is it a good idea to bury your ibcs to increase water pressure and jim is asking what are the tips of the trade for irrigating clay soils uh burying your ibcs i reckon they're pretty they're pretty sturdy i'm not sure how burying them would increase water pressure whether that's just the way that the question's been asked or whether that's as it sounds i don't think it increases water pressure the only way you'll get an ibc to increase water pressure is by either putting a pump off it or putting it up a hill um burying it will definitely keep it cooler because one of the problems with IBCs is that if they're sat out in the sunshine, they get quite hot and usually they are opaque, translucent. Um, so it lets through some light and that that um, encourages algae. So, yeah, warmth and algae is not a great thing to have in your water. Um, so burying it could be good for that. But I don't think burying it will increase pressure, even if there's a bit of a push for the soil from the outside that's um that's going to happen once you bury it and then there's no there's no sort it's not doing this you know it's not like squishing it out uh there's not going to be any significant increase in pressure from burying it um unless you bury it right at the top of the hill <laughs> um and then um the other the other question was uh, uh tips for, so louise if, if you haven't answered your question put your hand up and i'll allow you to talk and you can explain but the other question was from jim clay, soil. clay soils yeah yeah so the interesting thing with clay soils is that they 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 hold a lot of water so the first few weeks of dry weather they can seem pretty pretty robust you know they can they can keep supplying water to your plants but when you get when you get down to a certain moisture level in clay um, because of this thing I mentioned earlier, like the matrix potential, so like how much does that soil draw water away from the plant's roots and how much does it push water towards the plant's roots? The um, clay soils, once they get down to about 30% field capacity, which is, again, field capacity is the percentage moisture in a, in a saturated soil sample that has lost all the access to gravity, that may be about 40% in a clay soil, it could be about 40, 45%, maybe more if it's really heavy clay. Then once it gets down to about 30% of that in a clay soil, you're in trouble. You know, you're, you, the clay soil, once it starts to dry out more than that, starts to suck water out of your plants, which a sandy soil won't do. Uh, a sandy soil will dry out quicker, but it won't actually actively pull water out of your plant roots. And so a clay soil, two things you really need to do. One is to make sure that you're keeping that lower bit happy, like the lower third of the field capacity. Ideally, you're keeping it, you know, 100%, but certainly don't let it get down to wilt point, because once you get to that point, it's really difficult to get it back up to uh, a healthy moisture content again. The other thing is that they don't absorb water very quickly. So average clay soil won't absorb more than five millimetres an hour a lot less some of them less it depends if you if you've been cultivating it and you've got a good organic matter you're growing lots of green manures you've got really nice structured soil it will absorb a reasonable amount of moisture but um if it's a new clay soil that's been abused and perhaps hasn't got very good uh sort of surface organic matter it's going to absorb soil really slowly and so the combination of getting down to the wilt point, which is where you know you get down to that point where it's starting to draw water out or there's just no water there for the plant at all, nothing accessible, and not being able to get the clay soil back up again very quickly can be really quite uh, problematic for your crops. So keeping an eye on the moisture content in clay, it does, it's got a lot of buffering in clay. It really does hold on to water well. Um, so in the spring, you can usually 
go a bit longer than the sandy soils um, without having to get the irrigation out. But you've got to be really careful. You don't let it slip too far. And then your application kit has to be quite fine, slow um, application of water. So the clay has plenty of time to absorb it. And just keep a careful eye on how much it's getting down. And one last point on clay soils is that they can crack in really dry weather. And those cracks can just swallow all the water. Um, so again, a fine mist, um, which can be a problem in wind, on a windy day because it blows around. But that, the best thing for clay, the best type of irrigation for clay is a sort of finer mist, which if it does start cracking, won't mean it'll mean the water doesn't just all flow off into the crack. It, it actually just gets wet and then just keeps absorbing it. Um, yeah, because once the soil cracks, then those cracks don't. They don't really heal up even when it gets wet it has to get really wet you know it takes the best part of the winter for those cracks to really come back together again um so well if you see your clay soil starting to crack then it's it's you know you're you're into sort of the problem zone thanks pete so we've got about just just over five minutes left just uh, at this point i was just going to put in chat the I've just put the link to the session next Wednesday. So somebody in the questions has asked, I think I need to do a short course, e.g. a day. Does such a thing exist? Uh, as far as I know, it doesn't. But you can come to our bespoke session next week. We can submit your problems and get Pete and Tolly to answer them. Uh, Pete might have a, a different answer. And then I also, um, I'll, I'll put in the link to the webinar next week as well, the one on Tuesday, which is the... Sort of irrigation systems and i also just wanted to say thanks to tolly who's corrected us that bsp stands for british standard pipe not part and it's a universal pipe size across the world so thanks tolly for that we'll change it oh. discover unforgettable travel experience so i just um was finding a youtube link uh doo -doo -doo -doo. sorry there's a really good you, yeah you're there <laughs> sorry um there's a really good YouTube link that is surprisingly not, you know, it's not got a lot of views. There's only like 30 people have watched it and six people have liked it or something. But I was looking for something that explains the dynamics of soil a bit better. And this link worked really well. So I'm going to try and put it in the chat, but um, I'm just having a bit of trouble copying it. Oh, there we go. Um, so if I stick this, I haven't done anything in the chat. Should I put it in Q&A or in chat? Put it in the chat. And yeah. I'll, I'll send out links and a link to the recording of this, which will be on our and the OGA website to everybody that's registered okay. as well. So there are a few yeah. and, questions as well. And thanks, Tolly, for clarifying that. I actually always thought it was British Standard Park. Um, so, yeah, that's that's good. I. I um that I've put in the guide like under in the glossary. There's a lot of different standard parts, and American and British parts are different. Um, but they're like usually like standard threads, or as Tolly said, like pipe sizes. Um, but a lot of if we're talking about threaded fittings, um, there's a lot of different ones. But they tend to when they say BSP, they tend to all fit together. And so in a, if you're looking at irrigation catalog or um, a supplier, then it says BSP. You can usually be pretty sure that if you've got a BSP steel fitting and a BSP brass fitting and a BSP plastic fitting, that they will actually all screw together. But if you're putting, usually if you're putting them together in an irrigation system, you're going to want to put a bit of PTFE tape on it to make sure that it's well sealed. Thank you. Um, so there's three more questions. We've got five minutes. Okay. <laughs> um, so one, uh, going on for the drip tapes, uh, wondering how well drip tapes work on a bit of a slope. My my polyton is on a bit of a slope. Does it water evenly going down a hill? It's, her first, it's Hannah's first year and she's just adding clarity by saying the tape is sealed at the very end. <laughs> yeah, that's important. Um, depends on the tape. Most tapes are pressure compensated or pressure regulated, which means that um, they have a working pressure. So for drip tape, the, the thin board stuff, it's usually quite low pressure, usually under one bar, like 0 0.5 to 0 0.8 bar or something. And some, some go higher, but most of what people will buy will be under one bar. 
So you're going to want to make sure that the water pressure is is low, but not so low that it's below the working pressure of the of the drip line. And then you'll find that on the slope, it should compensate. So it should give, as long as you're working at the working pressure that's recommended, the lower drippers should be giving out the same amount as the higher drippers. Um, if you're going lower than that, it will tend to puddle at the bottom. And if you're going higher, then you risk the pipe bursting, um, as I'm sure uh, anybody who's used drip tape and has been doing it for a few years has experienced the exploding drip tape um, when it's running at higher pressure. So, yeah, running a, a pressure regulator in line with those sort of low pressure systems is important. If you're using drip, if you're using like soaker, soaker pipe or leaky pipe, that is usually, I'm, I, you know, I keep hearing that it's getting better, but I, when I, I used it in the past and it was okay as long as it's on the flat and uh, following the contours and it's not going for too long and then it sort of worked okay. But um, I don't think that's as well pressure compensated as drip tape or drip line that has specific um, emitters running along. So uh, yeah, make sure it's running at the working pressure. Um, and then it should be fine. Right. Thank you. OK, uh, there's a couple more questions which we might not have time for. I'll ask them both and then you can choose or answer both. So uh, Mick's asking, uh, apart from issues about water quality around obstruction licences, are there issues around what it might cost and whether you might not be allowed to obstruct in a drought situation? And Philip is asking, are there any brands of pumps that you or other people have had good experiences with? Yeah, so uh, boreholes, again, I've never commissioned a borehole myself um, and then used the water out of it. But from what I know, I've, I've put in the guide the kind of first steps of looking at boreholes. Yeah, it is quite expensive. Um, and if, you, if there's boreholes in your area and most people have had a successful borehole, then the chances are that you'll have a successful borehole. It's never 100% guarantee. Um, if there's not many boreholes in your area, there's probably a reason for that. And um, the the companies will often go down and you, 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 you hit water pretty quick. You know, the water table is not that far down, but there's a recharge rate. So as you go down, the amount of water that you've got in your column of borehole increases, obviously, and up to a maximum of 20 cubic meters a day which is your like uh maximum abstraction volume that you can take uh before you need a license uh if if you can make sure your borehole is able to, to take that then it should be fine um different areas different geologies are affected differently by drought so in some areas when you get a dry summer the water table will drop significantly and your borehole may dry up uh, it may even dry up just over time anyway, because groundwater, uh, you know, is a law of its own. You know, nobody really knows quite what's going on down there. But a lot of areas, the the water, once you get underground, is completely unaffected by what's happening on the surface. Um, and it may be more affected over the long term with um, other forms of, you know, if, if, if the water authority are taking a lot of water out of local rivers and reservoirs, that may have an effect down the line. But... Um, it's all really a bit of a mystery and the trouble is you're in the hands of the borehole drilling companies who essentially are happy to just keep drilling till they find water and keep charging you for every meter that they go down into the ground and so you need to find a really good company who um, you know you feel they're like honest um, and will do a good job of it and then um, you can look as it is in the guide you can look on the British, British Geological Survey website and look on their uh, geo index I think it is maps which will show you what boreholes are around and you can also find out what your geology is and get an initial survey done they'll do an initial survey for a small charge um, which might say definitely not or it might say yeah yeah you're in with a chance great and then I think if you if you want to last couple of Pump names, brand Yeah. Names. So, um, Larara, um, and the Aquajet, the um, DAB, DAB Aquajet, 
Um, that's one I've been using. It's been really good. It's like a cast iron body. Um, you can go for the cheap stuff. Like I've used Clark pumps for quite a few things and, and you know, they're, they're pretty good. They're not, they're not like terrible. Um, but if you want something that's going to be fixed in an installation, um, then I'm trying to remember the name of the one that we used to hang them for years. Um, lower a, a dab and yeah I can't remember the name of it the brand name it's gone out of my head too many things in there pushing everything else out so uh yeah but if you go to a decent irrigation supplier their main brands there won't be a lot between them I mean it's a bit like cars you know they're kind of all the parts are made in the same places and then they just put different badges on them um but if they're if they're you, you get what you pay for basically and if you're lucky a cheap pump will last a long time and if you're unlucky a good pump will break down um but are you i've been using the dab aquajet uh which is a brilliant little horizontal pump and it was like 300 quid um and it does everything i need for like watering an acre of wall garden yeah brilliant we're two minutes over pete thank you that's been absolutely amazing <laughs> Well, thank you for for uh, organising it all because um, that's not my forte, really. So uh, thanks everyone for li for listening. And for wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. And uh, yeah, I'm going to stop the recording now um, and say good night to everybody.